Hey, hi. Okay, everyone, thanks for, for waiting. This is Theory Wave Nights. I'm Mike Watson, and I'm here with Adam Ray Atkins, Mihai Moldovanu, and Jacopo Natoli. And we're presenting today another edition of the Beyond Linguistics Reading Group, where we'll be reading from Adorno and Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment. Um, Okay, so basically for those who, who are not aware, the Beyond Linguistics reading group involves us reading a given book uh, individually and then responding with an with a artwork or meme or performance to the reading and discussing the book in relation to our artworks um, and really kind of cementing uh, or concretizing this link between art and theory or art and politics so the dialectic of enlightenment is uh, an ideal book i guess for this purpose as it's an an early book in adorno's career that he co-wrote with max horkheimer which really kind of um is an opening onto all of his work in actual fact i mean all of that book somehow um forms a kind of thread or starts a thread with the whole of the rest of Adorno's work. So I I kind of wonder how Horkheimer comes into it, but it's probably something that I could research more. But certainly, uh, if you know Adorno's work, there are a number of things that are introduced in the Dialectic of Enlightenment that remain with him for the whole of his career up to when he wrote the unfinished work, Aesthetic Theory. And it's very much a book that points to the necessity of a kind of cultural outlook within, within the left wing. Uh, so it was kind of a, a, an a updating of Marxism, adding in a cultural uh, aspect um, to Marx's dialectical materialism. Um, other than that, I'm just going to say it's a very hard work, um, very difficult, perhaps partly for the translation, perhaps because Adorno was deliberately writing in such a way that he would almost negate what he had said within the same paragraph which is kind of part of his method of negative dialectics um so you know at at some points you you can find it very confusing and it's because it is confusing um but you know we're going to deal with it and and try and grasp some of the key concepts in in the first chapter called the concept of enlightenment um just i'm just going to basically say a couple of things before i pass to the artists here who are going to show us the artworks they've made in relation to uh, what I'm now going to call the D of E, Dialectic of Enlightenment for short, D of E. Um, so basically, um, I mean, the, the key concept here is the, is the fact that, well, two things, that enlightenment as a project uh, basically involves a, um, a, kind, a kind of trying to understand the world, of trying to, trying to, Uh, progress in the world by applying scientific categories by applying measurements by by uh, by how can we say boxing things in or as Adorno would say identifying them Uh, and this was kind of the innovation from religion that we don't take anything for granted or we don't believe anything we have to kind of first investigate it and that's supposed to kind of free us from religious religious tyranny um, which Adorno says works to some extent but actually fails and it fails in actually in, in, in a way that's not that distant from religion that because we kind of categorize and try to impl- apply rules, we end up kind of binding ourselves by the very rules that we apply. And this is the next kind of key concept is that Adorno says this, this aspect has been present since ancient magic ritual and through myth and through religion. So that enlightenment um, is not, kind of an escape from myth and myth is not some kind of primitive pre-enlightenment period but actually very much in keeping with Adorno's method uh, his negative dialectics myth and enlightenment contain contain each other okay they're kind of parts of the same whole Um, and you know if we think about myth or religion or, or magic these kind of three historical periods that Adorno identifies magic myth then then religion they're all reliant on some kind of again, identification, a kind of looking at objects and trying to bind them, trying to neutralize their power and trying to dominate them 
uh, in different ways. So with the magic ritual, you have like a fear of nature, a fear of the, the elements um, of uncertainty, and an attempt to try and bind that using magic charms, using kind of objects that are supposed to stand in for nature or are supposed to appease nature. Then you get mythic storytelling, which is kind of uh, an expansion of that and a kind of trying to appeal to nature by the creation of gods that stand in for different kind of elements. And then you get religion, which is kind of really a kind of, uh, um, well, kind of a similar thing, to be honest, but really kind of in, in a more complex way. Um, sometimes you actually kind of get rid of the intermediary objects, but you're still basically putting God, you know, between one's, between oneself, or between mankind and, and nature. And then you get enlightenment where you get nature, which is still fearful and still a threat, and we still want to dominate it. We say, okay, we're going to dominate it by measuring it, by understanding it. Um, and it's really the same thing. The numbers that we use to measure are not really very far removed from uh, the magic charms that we use to somehow mitigate against the risks of nature. So that's one of the, one of the main things that comes up in the concept of enlightenment. Um, other than that, we have um, this kind of interesting, where does it come in? Uh, I'm not going to talk much more, but actually I'm just going to say that it, that it kind of, it has something that really points to um, the whole of Adorno's theory. And it's this kind of awe in front of nature, this kind of fear in front of nature. And at one point discussing a kind of terror in front of nature. Um, and this is kind of an operative uh, element in Adorno's work, which is often overlooked, um, partly because the dialectic of enlightenment was, was kind of mistranslated as, as we're going to uh, in later editions of our reading group. Um, but just for now to say that this kind of notion of seeing nature uh, and, 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 of, and of feeling terrified of nature is kind of both an, an indication of how, how nature traps us or how we cannot supersede nature and at the same time gives us a clue to how we might live better with nature. And, and by that I mean that um, in, in this first chapter, Concept of Enlightenment, Adorno talks about a scream, a fear in front of nature and he in, in, in hints at a kind of paralysis and that paralysis is basically a kind of becoming one with nature that we, we, we are so terrified that we kind of, we're so terrified of this thing that can turn us to objects, this thing that has the power to kill us, that in our scream, we become momentarily paralyzed. I just want to hold that in mind because um, it may come up again when you're speaking and I might return to it at the end, but just to bear in mind uh, the idea of the terror, the scream in front of nature, and the paralysis and that moment of becoming object in the face of the natural object. And I'll kind of reveal later why that's important. Um, okay, so with all that, uh, I'm going to ask Adam Ray Adkins to show us his artwork and speak about how the Dialectic of Enlightenment or DOV uh, influenced it. Uh, if you can just unmute Adam, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, you said a lot of what I was thinking about with this. It's a, I really enjoyed reading this first chapter. It was a frustrating and um, stimulating read. Uh, I, I think something that really struck out to me with this was that I felt like it could easily be misinterpreted. And without like actually going through and quoting large portions of it, it would be hard to give the nuance that's in there, the back and forth and tension and nuance that was in it was, it's very impressive, um, even if it is hard to understand. So while I was reading this, I started cutting out the images that I wanted. Um, and then I realized together, they didn't have, I didn't have anything enough with enough space to present these. So I ended up doing three small canvases, they're about the size of my head, um, and kind of played those off of each other to build three separate scenes and highlight that tension I saw within there. So my first one that I am gonna bring up um, is called Identify and Contain. Um, it's a very abstract piece. There's a bit of metal on it. There's some clippings from a dictionary. 
a pack of cigarettes and then a small piece of a uh, Ziploc bag. Um, and this one is supposed to be the most natural looking. Um, and also kind of highlight that tear, like the first, like I imagine these early humans, um, cause like you said, it does go back all the way to magical ritual. Uh, this book is tracing from early, like what we might not even consider humans, like pre-human and, and early human civilization and mapping this cognitive building onto the world. So very abstract as if like an early human is looking at a sunrise through the forest or maybe a sunset rather, a sunset. Um, and then the second one I have uh, is the um, mimicry and myth. Uh, this one is a bit more uniformed. You see the same shapes repeated within it. Um, and the cigarettes are back there again. This time as the woman's head. Um, so instead of being this element of a landscape, the cigarettes have transformed from a cigarette pack into the cigarettes themselves and occupying the central consciousness of the uh, main character. With it, of course, up at the top, we have a man's face cut out with a woman's lips on top, uh, highlighting this identifying nature of the split of sexes into more strong gender roles as society develops out of early humanity into um, civilization. My third one goes into, uh, it is called the production of the possible. You see um, some of that mimicry there again, uh, that element that's contained within through the silver streak in it. And also this medical device um, or for our purposes, just industrial device, um, which also has this phallic slash cigarette-esque um, shape to it. We see a man wearing medical equipment coming out of a video game controller, uh, producing the eyeball that the main face in it is uh, missing. So they're highlighting what I really saw to be some of the end and conclusion of the book um, about how after these processes take place, this totalitarian aspect that enlightenment contains where through this identification, it comes to be um, what you are looking for. Anything that cannot be identified is just poetry. Um, anything that is and is real can be calculated and identified. So therefore that very system that says that ends up kind of predetermining anything that could be. So, you know, things like hope, are pushed out of the window because you're resigned to what actually is. Um, so the production of the eyeball uh, related to the identification the subject has there. Um, I know that's quite a bit, but those are my, that tension between those is how I read this book. Um, and I'd be curious to hear anything y'all have to say. Uh, can I say, uh, uh, hi everyone. I can I say about the second, uh, the second painting you showed, which uh, I told you before, the third one was my favorite, but I think now uh, the second. And uh, when I was looking at it, uh, it seemed to uh, be able to achieve this kind of um, mystical kind of uh, feeling where the elements are more than just the sum of their... Uh, like the, the picture is more than just the sum of the elements inside it. It's like, um, especially the face, the face where you told that you combined the um, man and the woman. Like to me, I was looking at it and I couldn't understand what was happening there. Like uh, it was so strange and it, it was, it seemed like it was peering behind uh, those, uh, those abstract elements uh, and uh, it kind of made me think about uh, what Mikey said at the beginning with the um, uh, with this shriek of this uh, of nature almost like maybe nature looking back at us or um, well I think it is something similar to or can be called maybe the shudder uh, where it, confu it confuses 
it confuses me a little bit. Um, and I want to say as well about the combination of, uh, is you had another picture of all the three paintings together, which I found interesting because I find myself again liking to see like the physicality of paintings for some reason in a digital form. And I just want to say about this and that now there is this Google Arts service, which like uh, they take pictures of painting with a really um, high megapixel camera and then you can zoom in right to the brush strokes. And that seems to be like the main part of, of this thing where you can see the brush strokes and it's supposed to be like the, the best part about it. But yeah, just my few thoughts, thanks. Thank you. It should be confusing. Um, and I kind of agree that the brush strokes are always the best part. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, carry on. Please go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to, to say this this picture. Um, I now forget the individual names. Hang on. Um, this production. I mean, as a whole. Production of the possible, um, particularly. Yes. Okay, but yeah, generally as well. Um, there is really this kind of this feeling of the the terror of the instrumentalization of nature, or how can I say the the you know the the kind of hum humans having been hollowed out by by rationality and by industrialization. There is this kind of this feeling. This this man, you say it's some medical procedure, but he has this equipment. This woman with her eye missing, uh, who looks kind of like petrified somehow. It really gets across well this uh, this notion of actually what Adorno would call second nature, of man fearing nature, then making a system to dominate nature and having that system actually dominate humankind itself, and that's what you would call a second nature, the the, the dominatory um, or hierarchical aspect of the system that man uh, made to free humanity. Um, and I keep saying man, but I mean humankind, but I've been reading too much Adorno and then, you know, in this era, from, you know, people are always saying man, meaning people as such. Um, but you will forgive me for that. But um, yeah, so, I mean, may I mention something about this, this scream and maybe some confusion, but yeah, the, he used the term shudder and um, that's the right term, okay? So basically the term shudder was used by Adorno throughout his career, um, and it's in the dialectic of enlightenment, but it's not in the English version, uh, which is something I found studying it years ago, because uh, I was fortunate enough to study with a German professor who helped me go through the German uh, version. Um, and basically this term shudder comes, comes in several times in the D of E. Um, and when it comes in, both translators, it was Jepcott and um, there's two main, main translations, sorry, two main translations, Jepcott and Cummings. Um, they both basically make the same mistake. If they don't keep translating what is in German shower for shudder, they translate it each time as horror, terror, fright. So they don't even uh, credit Adorno with, with intending to repeat this same phrase again and again, or the same word again and again. Uh, but he did intend it. And this, this shower becomes an operative work, not sorry, an operative part of his work right up to the final unfinished book, Aesthetic Theory. And basically, um, there's this kind of procedure, but it's kind of really hard to fathom. But if you keep reading through the different instances where Adorno mentions the shudder, you find that there's two aspects. There's first the, the cry of terror, which is the human paralysis in the face of nature, when they realize that they are object or they're turned to object by the nature that they're trying to dominate. And that's this kind of moment of paralysis, but that only lasts so long. And there's a release from that moment of paralysis. And that's what Adorno would call the shudder. That's the second aspect of this movement. So first you are awestruck by nature um, and you freeze. And that's when you become lost as part of the natural object in awe of it. Then you have this kind of shudder, this kind of shiver, which is your release from it. And then you realize what's happened. You realize that you were momentarily lost in the natural object, that you're no different from the natural object. But in realizing it, you realize that actually you are the unique human object that is aware of its objectivity. So there's this contradiction that we are both object and we are subject that is object. And this is very important for Adorno because all this kind of conflict between subject and object is unnecessary 
in a sense, because we're already object. But then he still has it that even so, it remains that we are this judging object. He's always going to have a problem fundamentally. Um, um, how can we say? Um, Why well, even accepting this fact that we are uh, object, and that's because we have this conscious element, uh, this element of knowing uh, that we exist, uh, albeit as objects. So that is maybe to help with the confusion a bit. And that's a lot of what Adorno is going through um, in the first chapters of uh, D of E. Okay, um, can, can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, Jacopo. Did, oh, sorry, did you finish, Mike? Yes, I did, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, so uh, first of all, thank you to invite me here. It's really a pleasure uh, to discuss Adorno with you. And yeah, and so uh, many things to say. I mean, it was so dense, even this like 10 minutes. Anyway, like I... I can see, can I see all the three paintings, Mike, like all together? Because I don't know, I made this, I don't know if you did it on purpose or it's just like it happens. So, uh, because at the beginning, uh, Mike did this like 3D, like uh, steps, like the first one, the magic word, then the myth, and then the religion, right? Which I could also use capitalism instead of religion, maybe. So like magic, myth, and capitalism and I don't know like possibly unconsciously I can like give to the first one like this magic moment of humanity the second one I can see like the myth and the third one I can see the capitalism the religion so it can be I don't know I see them li like a cover of those three uh, moments which I think are like crucial in uh, in the first uh, chapter but I guess you know in all the book like this because then it's Adorno seems like to contradict any time himself and that's really like that's may, maybe the most difficult like part but I think it does to break up the language so you know contradicting any time you just stop the power of language so it's something perhaps more poetic uh, let's say uh, so that's you, you want like any time don't go like really into meaning but like to anytime, you know, negotiate the, the meaning. So I can see, you know, those paintings, it looks to me like the cover of those uh, three uh, elements of, the, you know, the magic word, the, the mythic, the word of the myth, and then the word of religion. But I, I could also use capitalism instead of religion. And especially the relationship that, and that's what Mike was uh, telling before, which is again crucial, the rela relationship between subject and object. I, I'm reading a lot of like anthropology, those like days and like Mouse and the Martino and so on. So, you know, I, I seems to me that the magic word, the so-called magic word, I mean, we don't have any like writing on it, but we can like, you know, ba based on the anthropology studies, we can say that in the magic world, we were more able, let's say, to be object, you know, to lose our uh, ego. And I have the feeling that, you know, with mythology and then again with capitalism, this ability, let's call it ability, to be lost in the object, to be lost in nature is like, it's much more difficult. It seems like really impossible, especially nowadays with the super identity that we have also in the cyberspace. And so, you know, I can, and in this, in, in your paintings, I don't know if it's just my interpretation. Anyway, I can see those three different moments uh, of the book. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, th th thank you. Um, I, I think that is, you know, at least partially intentional. It's definitely became noticed to me um, as I was placing it together. Um, yeah, because it's very prominent in the, in, in the text. Um, and yeah, that's why I would just like that picture of them all together. That's absolutely how I would display this, um, kind of, um, yeah, alongside each other. I think they lose something on their own. Uh, I also thought it was very interesting in the translation. I have the first chapter is called the concept of enlightenment, which is what I named the three pieces together. But in the translation, it says the dialectic of enlightenment, like, you know, it's asterisk. And so concept is dialectic there, I guess. Um, 
there's there's a lot of translation notes in here, um, like you were saying, Mike. That really reading those clarified some stuff. Um, but I also kept in mind that I knew these English translations are considered somewhat flawed. Um, yeah, I I'm, I'm just want to say when uh, Jacopo was talking about the fragmentary nature of the text, that it's kind of fragmented and contradictory, and, and maybe that was on, on, on purpose because Adorno wants to defeat uh, the kind of prison of language, so to speak. Um, that was definitely a consideration, and that, that was something he was experimenting with, um, and it accompanied, accompanied his work throughout his career. Um, so there is this kind of feeling that you can kind of explode the false ideology, um, false thinking as such, or again, what he called identity, uh, this idea of categorizing things and the way that categorizing things uh, does not uh, perhaps rid us of the, of the threat of nature, which we can never really be rid of anyway, because we are nature. Um, you know, to get rid of that falsity by basically disrupting, by making an abstract language. But actually that brings me to a point that at some point he discusses uh, science as abstract. And I wondered if that might have kind of um, caused any confusion for anyone, or at least for me, I think it's something that maybe needs explaining. He talks about how um, the measure, measuring things, categorizing things, numbers as such, are abstract, leading to an abstract society and economy. Um, but of course, we often use the abstract as a kind of notion of something disruptive and otherworldly that can throw a spanner in the works that can disrupt uh, capitalism and the rational. Um, and actually, Adorno holds those two things in mind, that he thinks that abstraction can challenge science and rationality and capitalism precisely because they are also abstract. So abstract art points out the absurdity of um, in inadequate forms of measure or also with religion forms of worship um, you take something in place of something else um, so you have like a statue of a saint in place of the actual saint or the thing the saint evokes um, this is already an abstraction and uh, numbers of abstraction so really for him this is a similar thing uh, as making abstract artwork um, which is more likely to to uh, disrupt and expose the falsity of capitalism and its abstraction than a piece of art that's supposed to completely make sense that's, that's that you know it's supposed to have some logical kind of um, sequence um, but with that I think we will move to Mihai uh, Mihai's work um, so do you want to just tell us how you got here what were your things uh, sorry your things what were your thoughts um, as you were reading the DOV? Uh, yeah, so uh, um, I was trying to think uh, exactly, I guess kind of my thoughts were, was, uh, again, I found this contradiction uh, uh, as uh, Jacopo pointed out that um, I, I couldn't understand uh, for sure uh, what was the position um, of Adorno towards uh, the, um, uh, towards dialectics, the, towards the um, Platonic ideals, and kind of the history of, um, of 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 the of philosophy. And I was trying to understand whether he uh, he was against the kind of um, against these ideals, or uh, he was supporting something like that. Well, so I, I kind of tried to break it down a little bit and uh, I, I did a bit of research for Wikipedia and kind of tried to just clear my mind of uh, exactly what uh, his pos position is. So I've written down a few things here and uh, which also will uh, later uh, feed into my work and uh, and, and, and how what influenced me to make it. So um, uh, Adorno writes, uh, but the, okay, so I'll start to, with my text straight away. In their desire to destroy and organize life according to rational principles, they rejected universal categories and claims to truth. In the authority of universal concepts, the enlightenment detects a fear of the demons through whose effigies human beings had tried to influence nature in magic rituals. 
So uh, this is his quote. And uh, just to continue, uh, without the concept of universals, what particular things have in common, namely characteristic, characteristics of, of qualities, eludes us. Uh, so the, without the concept of universals, which the, the rationalists uh, or the positivists, they try to destroy, uh, we can't see uh, what particular things uh, have in common. We can't see their qualities. Uh, just for example, suppose there are two chairs in a room, each of them is green. These two chairs both share the quality of chairness as well as greenness uh, or the quality of being green. Uh, just to continue, idealism or conceptualism says that beauty is a property constructed in the mind. So it exists only in descriptions of things. But this does not mean that it is not constituent, constituent of reality itself and should be neglected. And instead, we should concentrate on measurable parts of reality. Uh, as we learn, measurable and universal aspects are not separated. For example, one might hold a number of particular yet abstract objects. The object can have universal qualities such as beauty or greenness, while at the same time having individual measurable qualities that are unique to the particular objects. So uh, both uh, are not exclusive. Uh, and uh, if we concentrate only on the individual qualities of the object, uh, as Adorno uh, points out, uh, we, well, for, first of all, it, uh, we become totalitarian in the sense that we concentrate on its um, particularities. And in this sense, uh, we're trying to gain some kind of control over it. Uh, so I just uh, wanted to add that humans rely on abstractions all the time. We cannot fall in love while at the same time being aware of all the bodily functions of our partner. We have to abstract from reality to be able to be human. We have to reduce the world of all the wealth of its differences, reducing it to a minimum of antagonism, as Zizek points out. But this process, we often learn more about the natural world than if we studied all the individual uh, quantifiable parts. Uh, so just to say a few things about my work. So when making this collage, I wanted to contrast uh, the, rational, the rationality of uh, the history of enlightenment. Uh, so as represented by different historical figures and devices uh, with the uh, true rationality or the logic of the world, uh, which eludes categorization and quantification. Uh, as you'll see, there's elements, um, there's, there, there's historical figures, uh, kings, there's different um, uh, inventions like the bear hunting suit from 18th century uh, as the two lovely figures uh, in the foreground are seen and uh, just uh, different um, mechanical elements but in the background we have this uh, this uh, thing that is not categorizable that is uh, this, uh, it's abstract um, so I first did this um, collage without the colors and without the, the abstractions in the background and I felt like uh, it was missing something. Um, it's really like I, I was struggling to make like an acid communist art and like what it means and uh, like I was afraid that I was making something that maybe was working uh, for this uh, uh, rationalist uh, system and uh, was supporting it. And uh, probably as, as uh, Adorno himself was always uh, afraid of this. Thank you, Mihai. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like your piece quite a bit. You know, what I'm getting from it um, is definitely that we kind of picked up on this on quant. I mean, it's there very obviously, but this, unquantifiable, uncategorizable um, background of nature and this like try to trying to escape from it. I think that's what really sticks out the most to me in your piece um, through it kind of it almost seems like there's like layers and layers that get more um, visible, more quantifiable. Um, and then 
all the way up front, you know, the most visible images are like the the royalty in the corner and then the people in the Siberian bear hunting suits. Um, those to me both stick out as kind of representing this, uh, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but this this way we dominate something, the humans dominate nature, this unquantifiable is from separating ourselves from it so thanks for those for those reflections there seem to be some comments coming in but i can't really pick them up right now uh if anyone can pick up the twitch right now and see if there's any comments we might want to respond to uh please do that i yeah we have some um they're mostly talks about um that distinction between myth and uh religion and uh a conversation about abstraction versus mimesis. Um, they're kind of more general questions. Uh, so I understood abstraction as something violent and opposed to mimesis. Uh, in abstraction, you want to turn the special into the general and eliminate what makes the other special. While mimesis, you coexist with the special other without taking away its otherness. Um, well, that, and then, um, I mean, I guess it's... Yeah, who uh, who said that? Um, M M Wales Wales. Okay, yeah. Um, well, this is kind of confused. This is where I raise this this issue of abstraction. Um, I mean, mimesis is where we kind of imitate nature to appear to be nature ourselves, and thereby evade the risk of uh, attack uh, from nature, so to speak. So it's like the mimesis that an animal undertakes. Um, playing dead, for example. So you mimic the 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 the, the nature, um, the natural object uh, in its most fearful uh, aspect, which is that it causes death. Um, but in so doing, the problem is that you are then exactly what you were trying to avoid. Okay. So in mimicking nature to avoid death, you become dead, and and that is that links back to this kind of idea of terror. Um, the, the scream, the cry in the front, in front of unfettered nature is that that scream and cry that Adorno calls in the concept um, of enlightenment, this first chapter that we read, he calls a naming of nature. Um, that naming of nature simultaneously um, is a kind of acquiescence to nature. The, the, the naming, the scream um, has a moment of rigor mortis. If you imagine screaming, there's a moment in which you're kind of completely still. Um, so that what he's basically saying is in the naming, um, you, you kind of, you, you, you do exactly what you don't, you do, you do exactly what you intend not to do. Um, and you revert back into the object. So it's all kind of confusing. The mimesis is a way of evading the object, but it turns you back into the object. And yes, abstraction is a way in which you could evade being categorized, but at the same time, um, capitalism, uh, that we would use abstraction against is in itself an abstraction that it that it ends up abstracting where it's supposed to be kind of identifying reality um and Adorno sort of does say all of this in in the chapter and that's what's frustrating that he's saying one thing and he's saying but on the other hand and he says the opposite thing and it's very much in line with his dialectics that he doesn't really believe in a dialectics like Hegel and Marx that leads up to an eventual kind of unity of two opposites he believes that the, the opposites already contain each other within them to an extent. So that this kind of um, com competition between thesis and antithesis will be eternal. They keep just kind of like attacking each other. Um, and that's his basically system of negative dialectics. But through the negative, the kind of critique of negative dialectics, the two poles um, constantly kind of critiquing each other and never arriving at a kind of resolution because they already contain each other anyway. And through that, you get critical moments which can kind of spur you on. Um, and you need, to kind of, you need to kind of keep engaging with this negative dialectic that doesn't produce a kind of deliverance from the kind of blighted conditions of, of, of life itself. You need to kind of engage with it to, to, to kind of seize occasional critical moments which, which are glimpses of truth, which can kind of spur us on and, and make things kind of temporarily worthwhile. But you have to consider this is a, this is a person who escaped Nazi Germany or at least fled. Um, and then many of his uh, relatives, friends, etc., would have been taken to the camps, uh, the death camps. 
Um, I mean, he's not seeing anything lightly. He doesn't want to see an easy way out because he just thinks that everything eventually um, basically returns back into um, into objectivity, into whatever you try and do to evade objectivity, objectivity is going to fall back into it. And there could not be a better example than um, not only the Nazi death camps, but the gulags uh, later on in, in Russia, that these kind of movements that, are, that attempt to... Um, kind of spur humanity on into a transcendentalism, into a utopia, result actually in in the most kind of both evil and banal objectivity simultaneously. Um, so, yeah, so, well, sorry, rather a long diversion, but um, that's kind of uh, somewhere in there is kind of why Adorno seems to constantly uh, contradict himself. Yeah, no, just one, you know... Uh say something about the painting it's like when i see it at the collage actually it's not a painting sorry me. I, uh, when i see it, it's like you see like it's small there the power i mean it's like you it's really small but it's the first thing that bam is just you know and that's napoleon if i'm not wrong right and it's like you know i just realized how it's powerful, the like symbolic, symbolic sphere of the power. And it's like, even if it is like really small there, it's like, it's really strong. And again, I don't know if I am applying my ideas to it or I still can see this like path uh, from the magic sphere, you know, which I see in the background. And I will also, you know, apply to the, a sort of, unconscious subconscious sphere which is you know really uh, magmatic is not clear uh, you cannot like um, it's more abstract too and then you know it's like again we have the two figures that when I saw them the face I guess it's because of the period that it looks like the coronavirus I don't know like the the, the two faces and and that's like, again, the mythological like moment. And then, you know, at the end we have this like uh, modern, because then with Napoleon, we also have this idea of, of, you know, the modern power, the idea of nation, the idea of the empire, the, the political one, and which is there, it's really small, it's subtle, but at the same time, it's so strong. And yeah, and I can see in the collage all like the beats of of the first chapter of of adorno okay, okay thank, thank you um and just yeah yes. to bring you in um on your um on your own work um so uh, so i mean what were your reflect i mean you've already talked about your reflections um whilst we've gone through other people's works but do you want to add anything uh in terms of your own reflections on the chapter we read and then basically go into your your own artwork Mm, yeah okay uh, so uh, i can like focus on a like bit of the of the chapter which was you know again i said was really was really strong it's like really really sharp and also you know short statement which goes like pam pam it it, it seems like it's shooting okay it's kind of shooting uh, uh, writing and you know uh, there is the part of the which is like the, the final part which i guess is introducing the second chapter which is talking about uh, homer and the myth of uh, ulysses of odyssey uh, odysseus on the odyssey odyssea okay oh again i read it in italian so i also read another translation i guess you know it makes a little bit of difference anyway and th there is like it's using uh, odyssey as a metaphor especially the uh, you know the book 12 uh, which is you know telling the story of um, odysseus which is like going uh, uh, on, on a ship to the sea and you know it get it, there are those mythological figures of the sirens you know which uh, they, they sing and with the singing they can just like attract you and basically kill you you want to hear the sound at the same time you know he, he doesn't want to die so he asks to tie himself uh, so he could hear and all his let's call it worker they could like keep uh, going with they couldn't hear the sound. So he used this chapter of, uh, as a metaphor 
of and you know I can quote the inter uh, the intertwinement of myth, power, and labor is preserved in one of the tales of Homer, book 12. And basically, you know, this, this image was really strong to me. And I say, you know, let's go to read back the book of Homer. I went to read it back. And then I start to think about the figure of Ulisse, of Odysseus. And, you know, I just thought that uh, Dante is uh, presenting this figure. It's, it's really powerful I, how he presented it. So I just thought that would be nice to share those uh, chapter, those canto of uh, Dante. And uh, again, also I choose to make a reading of something that I knew that you wouldn't understand, like the meaning, like the um, signified, just to be stuck a bit in the signifier, also because I just talked that, you know, this can be a sort of uh, idea that Adorno has of art, of poetry, you know, something more close to the signifier instead of the signified. So, you know, I'm going just to read it live. Okay, if I can just come in just before you do that, though, uh, Jacopo. Yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, so, so you're talking about the, the parable of the oarsman um, in uh, this first chapter, the concept of enlightenment uh, in the DOV, um, and when you just said... Um, Basically, Odysseus is on his journeys. Uh, he's in a ship, and he has to go past the sirens. These kind of women who sing this kind of enchanting song, but an enchanting song that will will um, get you in trouble, um, will kind of cause you problems. Um, and he basically, to evade the sirens, he has himself tied. He has himself tied, as you said, to the ship's mast, and he has the the ears of his rowers blocked so they can't hear the siren song either and it's a really good metaphor for power which is why, why i want to just repeat it um because you see that uh, odysseus uh, as the leader as kind of like uh, today we would think like the president or the banker um who has these men enslaved is himself enslaved so nobody really escapes in in uh, in capitalist society which is why i think adorno used the metaphor nobody escapes I, even post enlightenment um this kind of tyranny, which is self-imposed, um, the you know the, the, he he wants to he wants to be enchanted by nature, but then he knows there's a risk of being enchanted by nature. He knows the risk of nature per se, so that he he evades this enchantment, but then of course he's stuck. It goes back again. This is the thing that comes again and again in the chapter, is how humans have trapped themselves by trying to evade. Um, nature simply um so we're kind of back there again but you said that you you're gonna read dante because you like dante's treatment of odysseus i don't really know anything about dante dante's um treatment of odysseus can you just say something about this uh yeah so basically it's it's really easy there is like a chapter of the hell of the inferno or one canto which is the number 20 if i'm not wrong 26 on which basically, you know, the story of Dante is like hanging out in the inferno with Virgilio. And at some point, he just met Ulisse. You know, he just met him because Dante, in his uh, Divina Commedia, just put Ulisse uh, in the um, hell, in the inferno. So it's like, it's, it's, it's basically when Dante meet uh, Ulisse. So it's like, you know, a moment of, of meeting and there is like Dante explaining what is he, what is he and then there is like um, Ulysses speaking you know telling who he is and telling his With, like, U Ulysses being uh, just for the general audience Ulysses being uh, Odysseus no is it Odysseus? yeah yeah sorry yeah Odysseus yeah, yeah. Odysseus yeah, yeah. same um, okay so uh, when you want to yeah, when you want. I want to begin. I just want to get the PDF a uh, good size. Yeah. Um, so it's like it's not so long. It's going to be like seven minutes, more or less. So and it, this is presumably this is in old Italian. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. This will yeah, be yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's another thing. It's like this is uh, it's uh, the uh, Dante uh, work is is important because it was one of the first book written in in Italian, and it's 
also for Italians, it's not easy to understand, okay? Uh, but I mean, I think yeah. for us, it's interesting because it, it does become, uh, in a sense, abstract because, exactly. I mean, actually, I, I will be able to follow probably most of it. Um, but if, you're, if you don't know any Italian or especially kind of, you know, Italian from several hundred years ago, then, then you, yeah. you're going to kind of hear it more as an abstract. Um, but also what's really interesting is that you've made this kind of PDF, you've drawn over the... Uh, the text so that in itself appears like an abstract artwork yeah it's like you know it's like nose for the reading it's like you know yeah okay so when you're ready okay, okay, we'll... okay. godi fiorenza poiché se si grande che per mare per terra batti l'ali e per l'inferno tuo nome si spande tra lì ladron trovai cinque cottali tuoi cittadini onde mi vien vergogna e tu in grande orranza non ne sali ma se presso al mattin del verghi sogna tu sentirai di qua da picciol tempo di quel che prato non caltri tagogna e se già fosse, non saria per tempo, così fossei da che pur esser dee, che per più mi graverà con più ma tempo. Noi ci partimmo, e su per le scalee che ne aveva fatto i broni, a scender pria, rimontò il duca mio e trasse me, e proseguendo la solinga via, tra le schegge e tra rocchi dello scoglio, lo pie senza la man non si spedia. Allora mi dolsi e ora mi ridoglio quando drizzo la mente a ciò che io vidi e per l'ognieno a freno che io non soglio perché non corra che virtù non guidi sicché se stella buona o migliore cosa m'ha dato il ben che io stessi non mi invidi. Quant'è il villan che al poggio si riposa nel tempo che colui che il mondo schiara la faccia sua a noi ti è meno ascosa come la mosca cede alla zanzara verso l'uccio giù per la vallea forse colla dov'è vendemmia e ara di tante fiamme tutta risplendea l'ottava bolgia siccome io mi accorsi tosto che fu il lavel fondo parea e qual colui che si vengiò con gli orsi vide il carro d'elia al dipartire quando i cavalli al cielo erti le vorsi che non potea sì con gli occhi seguire che il vedesse altro che la fiamma sola siccome non voletta in su su salire Tal si muove ciascuna per la gola del fosso, che nessuno mostra il furto e ogni fiamma un peccatore in vola. Io stava sopra il ponte a vedere il surto, sicché sì io non avessi un ronchion preso, caduto sarei giù senza essere urto. E il duca, che mi vide tanto atteso, disse... Dentro dai fuochi son gli spiriti, che tu non si fascia di quel che egli è inceso. Maestro mio, risposi io, per udirti sono io più che certo, ma già m'era avviso che così fosse e già volevo dirti. Chi è in quel fuoco che vien si diviso di sopra, che par sugger della pira dove Eteocle col frate fu miso? Rispose a me. Là dentro si martira Olisse e Diomede, e così insieme e la vendetta vanno come all'ira, e dentro dalla lor fiamma si geme l'agguato del caval che fe la porta, onde uscì dei romani il gentil seme, piangevi si dentro l'arte che, per morta, dei dadima ancor si suol d'Achille, e del palladio pena vi si porta». Se io posso dentro da quelle faville pallar, dissi io, maestro assai ten piego e ripiego, che il prego vaglia mille, che non mi facci nell'attender niego, finché che la fiamma cornuta qua venga, vedi che del disio per lei mi piego. Ed egli a me, 
la tua preghiera è degna di molta loda e io perciò l'accetto, ma fa che la tua lingua si sostenga, lascia parlare a me che io concetto ciò che tu vuoi, che i sarebbe schivi perché è fur greci, forse del tuo detto. Poi che la fiamma fu venuta quivi, dove parve al mio duca tempo e loco, e in questa forma lui parlare audivi. O oh, voi che siete due dentro ad un fuoco, se io meritai di voi mentre ch'io vissi, se io meritai di voi assai o poco, quando nel mondo gli altri versi scrissi, non vi muovete, ma l'un di voi dica dove, per lui, perduto a morir gissi. La maggior corno della fiamma antica cominciò a crollarsi, mormorando, pur come quella cui vento a fatica, indi la cima qua e là menando, come fosse la lingua che parlassa, gittò voce di fuori e disse «Quando mi diparti da Circe, che sottrasse me più di un anno là, presso a Gaeta, prima sì e ne ha la nomasse, né dolcezza di figlio, né la pietra del vecchio padre, né il debito amore lo qual dovea Penelope far lieta, vincer potero dentro a me l'ardore, che io ebbi a divenir del mondo esperto, e dei vizi umani e del valore». Ma misi me per l'altro mare aperto solo con un legno e con quella compagna piccola dall'acqua al fui diserto. L'ullito e l'altro vidi infine la Spagna fino al Marocco. E li sono dei sordi. Quell'altro che a quel mare intorno bagna. Io e compagni eravamo vecchi e tardi quando venimmo a quella foce stretta dove Ercole segnò i suoi riguardi a ciò che l'uomo può oltre non si metta della man destra mi lasciai Sibilla dall'altra già m'avea lasciato setta. O frati, dissi, che per centomila perigli siete giunti all'Occidente a questa tanto piccola vigilia di nostri sensi che del rimanente non vogliate negar l'esperienza di retro al sol del mondo senza gente. Considerate la vostra semenza, fatti non foste a viver come bruti, ma per seguir virtute e canoscenza. Gli miei compagni feci io si aguti con questa orazione piccola al cammino che appena poscia li avrei ritenuti e volta nostra poppa nel mattino di remi facemmo ali al folle volo sempre acquistando dal lato mancino tutte le stelle già dall'altro polo vede la notte il nostro tanto basso che non surgea fuori del martinsuolo Cinque volte raccese tante casso, lo lume era di sotto della luna, poi che ne entrati eravamo nell'altro passo, quando non apparve una montagna bruna per la distanza, apparve mi alla tanto quanto veduta non aveva alcuna. Noi ci allegrammo e tosto tornò in pianto, che ne della nuova terra un turbe nacque e percorse del legno il primo canto. Tre volte il fe girar con tutta l'acqua, e la quarta levar la poppa in suso, e la prova i rengi, come il tuo piacque, infine che la mamma suso, la nuova di un diviso. Ok, that's the end. Damn. Really liked it. Gave me chills. The siren songs. It was really something, yeah. I mean, that's kind of why we why we're doing this to kind of mix up the the philosophy uh, with something entirely unexpected. And yeah, that was unexpected. <laughs> I have to say, I found myself at first feeling okay. This is just words, and then feeling kind of this mystical quality develop into it and then this need arose in me to try and categorize what i was seeing and hearing like i really wanted to figure out the systems um and the meanings of these scribbles and signs and color changes that were in it and uh 
so it, I don't know, it kind of like drove home this point of um, the totalitarian nature of enlightenment thinking that's been drilled into me, um, or that I am a subject of. I had a similar experience of trying to understand uh, uh, what was the narrative, what, what was uh, trying to be told to me. Uh, and uh, also I, I, I had this feeling of uh, a loss of myth, of this, uh, that we lost myths and with it we lost something important. And Yeah, I think I can, li I think I can link it actually straight into um, the conversation we're having, straight into uh, my artwork and we can still manage to talk about uh, Jacopo's reading just then. So I made a kind of a meme, I guess. Uh, well, anyway, a JPEG. And it has a cover of the Dialectic of Enlightenment, uh, one, one of the covers, and I've added a few things. So I have in the bottom right this kind of caveman shouting. So this kind of relates to all these times that Adorno talks about a primeval man and the fear of nature and trying to control nature. Um, and then you have on the other side a kind of modern man um, and uh, well quite effeminate that could be man or woman I suppose but I thought I thought a man when I put it there um, and you have this kind of COVID-19 uh, virus cell inevitably uh, behind because I couldn't think of anything else <laughs> at this moment uh, but because it's kind of a good indication of nature the thing we, we fear and we're trying to overcome uh, but we have to accept many times that uh, well, nature's going to get us in the end. Um, and then there's a volcano representing kind of nature in the other sense. The more obvious sense, we think of like a fearful nature, uh, kind of big natural events uh, that we can't uh, control. And then under that, it says, it's kind of a play on Vedi, uh, this Latin phrase. Of what is it? Now probably Jacopo knows. Uh, uh, Vedi, 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 we came, we saw, we conquered. Um, I don't remember the, the full phrase, but um, uh, actually in original Latin, it's I, I came, I saw, I conquered. Uh, I think there's a film where it's we came, we saw, we conquered. Uh, maybe it's a Ghostbusters or something. Uh, probably been in a few films, but uh, it says, under that it says first mistake. So we came, we saw, instead of we conquered, we named, naming being a process of conquering, naming or measuring or uh, making ridges icons or magic charms for Adorno through history. This is all kind of a process of false identification of nature. So uh, again, we came, we saw, we named first mistake. Okay. And then there's a Megadeth song, first mistake, last mistake, no more mistakes. I don't remember which, which song it is. Uh, but it made me think of that as well. Um, but that is the first and last and, and ongoing mistake of humanity is what I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say through the image um, that we constantly try and um, dominate uh, nature and each other um, through kind of applying names and categories and it always kind of messes up somehow and then this COVID-19 seems to be an example of that whether it whether it's spread through um, live markets in China or whether it's spread through animals um, moving because their habitats were destroyed. It's still a, an issue of the relationship between man and nature. Indeed, if it was actually man-made in some, to some extent or in some respect um, in a laboratory or something, it would still be a problem of the man's relationship with nature. Uh, any which way we look at it, it, it relates to that and just to the fact that um, whatever we do, we're always going to be blindsided, blindsided by nature. Um, and I suppose this is what Adorno is saying. It's never really touched upon. He keeps talking about this nature that we can't dominate, that we try to dominate throughout and throughout his work. And I think the tendency is to think of this as like the volcano that we can't stop or the earthquake or whatever. But I mean, it's us, literally, it's in us. I mean, we're getting older all the time. Uh, anyone is, um, we get ill, we, you know, th this nature is going to overcome us eventually. And Adorno doesn't seem very positive uh, on any way to overcome this. In fact, he doesn't seem to want to overcome it. He's certainly not a philosopher that says, okay, through tech, one day we might develop ways of living forever or something. 
he's more about acquiescing to nature. He seems to be saying the only way we can really um, deal with this is to accept our being one with nature. In that respect, if you think about the parable of the oarsman we spoke about before, about Odysseus um, tied to the mast of the ship, trying to evade the sirens, you really think, well, it might just be better if he, if he hears the sirens and just faces that head on, you know, rather than plugging his ears to the sound of the sirens and um, restricting his, his uh, oarsmen, trapping them as well. Um, this is the thing, I suppose, with governments, is that they, to try and save us, they tend to restrict us. And we're seeing a, seeing a prime case with um, COVID-19 and the um, lockdown measures, which, of course, are necessary to some extent, but you wonder to what extent. And in any case, it's just a, it's a good metaphor, or a good not even metaphor, it's a real-life thing, but, but it's kind of a good correlate to Adorno and the parable of the oarsmen, the leaders that trap the population in order to, in order to save them from nature. But then it's... You know, it's again Adorno's second nature. In doing that, they become a barbaric second nature, which in any case is is uh, trapping us and in a way killing us because it's making us objects. We in our houses, protected to stop us dying, become in a sense metaphorically uh, dead. Um, so um, that's kind of what my JPEG image is saying. I don't know if anyone has any any comments on that. I see that, yeah, immediately, um, and I think it's an effective image, it's funny, um, and it fits the theme of being some kind of collage or repurposing that um, we've all, uh, all of our works, um, you know, even the, the spoken and manipulated Dante has been this. Um, but I do want to ask you about something. So you said um, that it seemed like maybe Adorno saying that we should like give in to this nature or something, but there does seem to be this element. Um, I'm not sure what he, what he means exactly by it, but, but of hope. Um, so I'm thinking of this quote, uh, enlightenment thereby re regresses into mythology. It has never been able to escape uh, for mythology had reflected in its forms, the essence of the existing order, cyclical motion, fate, domination of the world as truth, and had renounced hope. Um, so to me, like that kind of, when I read that, for some reason it stuck out to me as a pretty important passage um, in so that the, the idea would be to get past cyclical nature. Maybe not nature altogether. Well, this is, um, but the, um, I did pause on that. I think the same quote, but I'm, re I'm reading a different translation. So, uh, I mean, Adorno is not, is not by any means saying we should return to kind of primitive conditions or that we should embrace nature in a kind of tree-hugging uh, way. So I'm not saying that in, in, in any sense. And, and you're right that there is some kind of hope. Um, I mean, he's, he's, he's a bit Marxist. I mean, obviously, he's, he was part of what we call a Frankfurt School, but also is called Western Marxism, um, as in Western European um, uh, I guess distinguished from Eastern uh, Soviet bloc, etc. Um, but um, Western Marxism basically is a is a kind of supplement of Marx. I mean, Adorno doesn't really go into Marx very much, but I think you have to think about Marxism and the way Marx says that capital provides us with the tools to to supersede capital in the in the amount of wealth it produces and, and the bringing together of the masses it provides a framework that if we could take that over, we could then set up something better. We could use the tools of capital to set up the utopia. Um, Adorno, uh, I think, is pointing at a similar thing with his hope, um, that he sees enlightenment, enlightenment as bad and as repeating the same mistakes of myth, religion, and uh, magic ritual. Um, but he also sees something in it that could lead us out of, of capitalism or, or domination as such, uh, the domination of the masses that runs throughout all of these historical periods. Um, right. And it is something in, you know, these kind of magic charms, these um, religious icons that stand in for something else that give us a temporary relief that 
is there any way that one could kind of capture that element and put it into an object that doesn't have all the problems of these other objects so a religious icon says like, i'm a religious icon i will deliver you from this uh, but it comes with a price the, the, you know i will deliver you from this if you submit to god which actually is submitting to the pope or the the, the archbishop or whatever um adorno kind of hints i think in the concept of enlightenment the chapter that we read at what might lead us out and it's this makes me think that dialectic of enlightenment is really a strong precursor to aesthetic theory and it already contains everything he says there he talks about the artwork for a bit as being this kind of um demarcated space did you did you read that part um so the artwork is like an icon it's a demarcated space but he's saying that it's a de demarcated space sorry a fenced off space this thing that one calls art um that differs from the icon and the the religious uh sorry the the religious icon and the mythic charm um because it doesn't point anywhere um and this is where i think when you go to aesthetic theory uh, a couple of decades later um he basically uses the artwork and says that the artwork the abstract artwork which is effectively a demarcated space which we give attention to if we kind of through that abstract artwork have the same quasi transcendental experience that we're supposed to have for a religious object object uh i'll repeat that sentence again because we're going to put this on youtube okay um if we have um through um the artwork the same quasi transcendental experience that we are supposed to have through the religious icon uh, or through um, the magic charm or through unfettered nature through the awe of nature if we can have that through the artwork we might actually reach some kind of transcendence because the artwork isn't in itself appended to any any uh, power system do you see what i mean um that's kind of to simplify but also um the artwork in a way it learns the tricks of the capitalist commodity of the religious icon in that it says like okay i'm just an object but i'm something else too um which is what you know which is what um a capitalist product does it's like a, you buy a new white shirt it's only it's, it's only a piece of linen but it's supposed to kind of make you more attractive and get you uh better jobs and better girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever you have um but um actually it's only just an object and the rest of that is just your imagination you've been kind of co-opted by the object with the artwork what Sadorno is suggesting is that the artwork does all that it says i'm going to give you all this and actually what it says i'm going to give you something even better than all that crap that you can get if you buy nice shirts and cars and toothpaste and whatever i'm going to give you total transcendence from this whole system because as an artwork I'm free from that system. And that's where you get carried away with that artwork. You have this kind of moment of, of being separated from the four conditions of life when you become lost in that artwork. And then you're thrown back onto yourself suddenly because that moment of being lost can only last so long. And it's that moment of being thrown back into yourself, but without any kind of, um, um, kind of law dictating or kind of system dictating that you are kind of owned by capital or that you owe something to the Catholic Church or whatever that being thrown back on yourself is a moment of freedom which you realize um, the real conditions of, of existence of, of, of being this kind of subject that is linked to the natural object but somehow kind of still separated from it with your own free conscious own free conscience um, I don't know if that kind of helps at all no, thank you. It does. Um, yeah, absolutely. See, this is um, this is something about this this first chapter, and I've already started reading the second chapter now. Um, and it seems much more straightforward. This first chapter is so interesting for that. Like, there's these little moments, like that part about art, which is like um that you were just talking about, which is only like a page or less than a page. And then these little parts about hope, which really seem to change so much of these arguments there's these little things thrown in there um yeah. it seems to be a text that could very easily well, I think, um, lead to bad things with a lazy reading like you well, could you could cherry 
uh, pick these quotes and make it seem like Adorno is trying to say, no, magic was good and we should return to primitivism. Well, this is true, like actually, that. yeah. But that's something that I, 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 I forgot to say. Um, and I'll just try and keep it really brief now. Um, but basically, this thing of the hope uh, that he sees... It's not so much, I think, uh, leading into a new time. It's more that, as he says, uh, I think several times in the chapter, myth already contains enlightenment and vice versa. So if you're going to talk about, is he talking about return to, a return to a golden age? Or is he talking indeed about uh, moving ahead towards a utopia? This is kind of irrelevant because all these things are already kind of coexistent for him. Um, the hope is just that, if, if all we're doing is, is repeating this process of identifying, categorizing nature, the hope is that we can do this um, in a way that's more kind of amenable to accepting the true conditions of existence. Um, and that's, I think, what he's looking at with the artwork. But there is no real return to, to myth or to, to kind of pre-mythic time in this kind of like, moment of looking at the artwork and getting lost temporarily losing consciousness of time and space as, as, as such um you you're not returning to when primitives experienced the same thing when they were awestruck by nature because when they experienced it they also lost the concept of time and space so how can you be returning you know it's kind of historical sense to anything um it's it's a singular a moment that stands outside of time and space which is probably why uh, for Adorno, it resists all the problems of, of uh, controlling capitalism and pre-capitalist systems. I mean, can I, can I add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, like so many to say is like, you know, just like, okay, let's start with the idea. I mean, you said that this idea of art that Adorno has, and I don't know, just like now it seems so close to the Bre Brecht idea of theater. Adorno the theory of, of art anyway like uh, as far as I know the theory of Adorno in art is like you know the white cube he said you know the white cube it will be a separated space on which I go and in the white cube I can have like this transformation and out of time or, or, and space maybe and then I can bring back this transformation into my into my life so you know it's like something separated you know life and art i go to art and i go to the white cube and then i go back to life like transformed and yeah and as far as i understand that's like the way that adorno sees art especially even through this first chapter that we just uh, read and then i i would like to add something you know related to your uh, image and to what you were uh, uh, speaking about this like fight of nature and of human uh, being, which I would call also nature, maybe we can call it like death, because I can see now, especially with this virus, it's like nature, you know, just came back, but came back with the fear of death. And, you know, capitalism and modernism just want to keep death away, you know, especially because if you are death, you don't produce and you don't consume anything. And that's another problem also in Italy because now is even not longer, um, we don't have access to the funeral, so to this ritual. So it's like, you know, keep like separating the fear of nature and especially the fear of death. And, you know, and I think that the magic word is just uh, coping differently with this because it's like, it doesn't want to keep that separated. It's more like, okay, so I can be lost in nature. I can be nature. I can be that object. So I get lost a bit my ego, my identity, and then probably being lost, I can cope with this. I think there is a different strategy with capitalism. It's not, I, wa I will be lost in nature so I can cope with this, but I will keep separated uh, from uh, me, this idea of death, of nature, this fear. And, you know, but we can see that historically speaking, this fear and this, the consequence of keeping this separated are coming back. And, you know, now with the virus, we have this like death in front of us. We feel ourselves like someone which 
can actually die. And, you know, and capitalism is trying to telling us the opposite. We are always young, beautiful, you know, we are there eternally. We can, you know, buy any day something new. It's like, and yeah, and this fight, I think, is crucial. And I think that Adorno feel this kind of tension of, of this kind of, you know, fighting. And it's like, I mean, maybe a question can be uh, moved like from the, this chapter and this discussion is like, how can we deal with nature? How can we cope with, with death nowadays? That is really what, what we're driving at. And, and maybe like the, the most useful thing we can say for today, I suppose, is, is that we, we can't control um, nature. And the only way we're really going to uh, solve this issue, this problem of nature that we've been trying to solve for all of humanity's existence, is by somehow acquiescing and just accepting um, and that's probably, you know, not going to happen very easily unless we change our attitude um, to death. But that, that would be the key to everything, because I suppose it's our fear of death, um, our fear of nature as such. But I mean, what is there to fear of nature except for death? So um, the fear of nature as such that leads to conflict, that leads to us uh, wanting more. Um, I guess that people in power, it's often said, in fact, Adorno co-wrote a book called The Author Authoritarian Personality, looking at um, what were the traits of authoritarians and found them to be highly insecure. So I guess what we have is um, people running countries that are really acutely scared of death and to try and shore up their position, they then uh, end up controlling everyone else and killing many people in the process through negligence or quite deliberately. So again, this contradiction keeps coming back that you try and control nature and you become a second nature or really you, you embody the tyranny, ty tyranny hang on, or really you embody the tyranny of, of nature. Um, and it couldn't be clearer today. And it's just a shame that so, so many people clearly can't just go, well, okay, you know, we're here for the moment. And uh, and just kind of chill out a bit about uh, about the, the inherent fact that we're all going to die. I guess it could be a good a good place to end. And any any other comments? Any final comments on on that or something else? No. Okay. No. I mean, it's no. Like, okay. That's no, that's yeah. Uh, well, yeah. We, we leave you with that. Um, so. Um, Thank you yeah, very Mihai's much. Mihai's computer to, died. Uh, Mihai uh, is no longer with us. I mean, in the sense that he's not, he's not here. I mean, he's with us. He's still on the planet, I think. His computer um, confronted nature. His computer, yeah. His computer bit the, bit the bullet. How do you say? Bit the dust. Um, so with that, uh, thank you, Jacopo. I do hope you come back next time, which is in two weeks, uh, for our reading of the next chapter, or our response to the next chapter. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to the audience. This will shortly be on YouTube, the channel Theory Wave Nights. So I uh, hope you can pick it up there. Okay. Bye-bye.